The resulting Supreme Court case concerning constitutionality of what transpired in that school is now part of the lexicon of First Amendment rights for students, teachers, and schools. Neither teachers nor students shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate was a quote by Justice Abe Fortas in ruling in favor of Mary Beth Tinker and her fellow petitioners. Her case has been cited in over 6,000 student right cases and it's taught in most American civics and history textbooks. I am honored and privileged to present to all of you Mary Beth Tinker. Mary Beth. Thank you, Greg. Thank you so much. That was really nice. Thank you all. Oh, and thank you to all of the judges who are here today to help you learn about the Constitution and the lawyers. Can you believe this place? Isn't this amazing? Come on, guys. This is really good. Wow. They, they, they must really want you to learn about the Constitution. Huh? And what a journey it's been. I, I was thinking this is probably kind of like the court where I went when I was, you know, about 14 years old. And we, had, we were just really upset about war in general, us kids. I was growing up in a time, as I said earlier today, that there was a lot like now. It was mighty times which one student recently called these days that we're living in right now. And that's the kind of time that I grew up in also, mighty times. Do you think so, guys? Who thinks it's mighty times? Come on, mighty times. Wow. There's so much going on and so many decisions we have to make about what kind of world we want to live in. And, and do we want to um, you know, have the well-being of children be foremost and, and important in our world today? Because a world that's good for kids is actually a world that's good for everyone, as it turns out. But it's not that way today. Right now, the well-being of kids is not our top priority. And it was kind of the way when I was growing up also. I, I was growing up in a little small town in Des Moines, Iowa. And my dad was a Methodist preacher. So you know, we would hear the choir sing songs like, oh, um, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Some of you have heard that, right? <laughs> Come on, help me out here. Well, the problem was maybe Jesus loved all the little children, but not everybody in town did. The swimming pool down the street wouldn't let certain children swim at the swimming pool. Guess which children? What do you say? Which ones? The black children. How did you guess? The black children couldn't swim at the swimming pool. And these issues are still going on today, right? In fact, last summer I saw some big issues going on with swimming pools in our country. But regardless, some of the kids at the church asked my dad if he would go with them up to the swimming pool to stand up about that and to say that that wasn't right. As kids always have done through history, these kids noticed when something wasn't fair, when it wasn't democratic. It didn't follow our Constitution. And maybe they didn't know all the articles of the Constitution, but they knew that it wasn't right. And that's what kids, that's what you all are so good at. And what kids have always been good at all through history. They saw that this wasn't fair and they decided to, the next step, take action. And as it turns out, it's right in your brain chemistry. I love studying teenagers' brains. You're so fascinating. That'd be a good school report, guys. Teenagers' brains. As it turns out, you have the chemistry, you have the structure right in your brains to see things that aren't fair, and then to want to take action. Yeah, it's amazing. It's sort of related to the dopamine and all these interesting things. But regardless, these kids decided to take action, as kids have done all through history. And they went up to the swimming pool, and they said, that's not fair. That's not right that these kids should not be able to swim here. It's hot in the summer. Guess what the people at the swimming pool said? Too bad. That's the way it's always been. Life's not fair. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. And people say, Jet, just get used to it. Life's not fair. Well, I want to tell you, don't get used to it. Because life should be fair. And that's where young people are so powerful, because you, you notice that and you stand up for that. Well, as a result of that, my dad wasn't too popular in town. Because when you speak up for something, you're not always so popular. 
But he didn't care. He kept doing it. He kept talking about his principles that run through all religions, the, the principles of love and brotherhood. And he lost his job, actually, in Atlantic over that swimming pool issue. And we had to move to a whole new town, Des Moines, Iowa. Well, there, I was about 10 years old when I was watching TV one day, and I saw the most amazing children on TV. I was very shy, and I was one of the youngest kids in our family. We had six kids in our family. And I liked to go roller skating and go to slumber parties and, and play croquet and things. But these kids were different. They were amazing. They were the strongest, bravest kids I'd ever seen in my life. And they were in a place called Birmingham, Alabama. That year, Birmingham was actually called Bombingham because the Ku Klux Klan had bombed so many black churches. And so these kids were standing up and speaking up against the Jim Crow law of segregation because Martin Luther King was in jail. He was writing his famous letter from Birmingham jail. And he couldn't do it. And the adults, a lot of them were speaking up and standing up, but there weren't enough because they were scared. They were scared of the Ku Klux Klan and the terrorism that was going on there in Alabama, and so the kids said, we will do it, we will speak up, and almost 2,000 kids came marching out of their 16th Street Baptist Church, which was their headquarters there. They made that their headquarters. And they were singing songs like, um, this little light of mine, come on, help me out, guys. I'm gonna let it shine, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This the light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Yeah, they were letting their light shine, right? Come on. And they were doing what kids have always done all through history. They were speaking up and standing up about an injustice, about something that's not fair. And they were taking action. I saw them on TV, and I said, those kids are amazing. They're so brave and so Because guess what the police did? It's like Martin Luther King said. Sometimes the law can be used for justice, and sometimes it's used for injustice, right? And that's exactly what was happening there. And sometimes it's still being used today for injustice. But at that time, kids spoke up and stood up about it, and so they said they were going to go on a march, and they came marching out of their church, and we know what songs they were singing there. And so when they came out there, guess what the police chief did? Bull Connor. He put the German Shepherd dogs on them, right? Have you seen these photos? These photos went viral all over the world. They attacked the kids with dogs, and they attacked the kids with their water hoses, but the kids didn't stop. They kept coming, they kept coming, and they had to build an outdoor prison of barbed wire for these kids. Kids nine years old, 10 years old, 15. Their parents weren't sure even what had happened to them because they were taken off to this outdoor prison. I thought those kids were really something. And so did Martin Luther King, because he said he'd never seen anything like it and that it was the turning point of the civil rights movement that day in Birmingham, May 2nd, 1963. We've just passed the 50th anniversary. But I said, well, I'm not like those kids. I'm not anything like those kids, because I want to go roller skating, and I wasn't about to go out and face any German Shepherd dog. But the next year, there was, there was another amazing action in our country of young people. And it was in Mississippi this time. It was called Mississippi Freedom Summer. That year, there were about 3% of African Americans registered to vote. Why? Because of the Ku Klux Klan reign of terror. If you dared to go to try to register to vote, you could be shot and killed. You could be threatened. You could be humiliated and turned away from the courthouse. It was another example of the law being used for injustice. But young people decided, we're going to stand up about that. And they came from all over the country, over 700 college kids that time. And they came down to Mississippi, and it was called Mississippi Freedom Summer. And, and as soon as they got there, three of them disappeared. Their names were Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman. They disappeared off the face of the earth. Nobody knew what happened to them, but everyone suspected it was the Ku Klux Klan. And so there was a call that went out all over the country, please, people, come to Mississippi this year so that these these young people don't get killed fighting for the voting rights of our people in the United States and standing up for democracy. And this is why we needed a Voting Rights Act, by the way, which was passed that year by Lyndon Johnson. But regardless, when they disappeared, there was a call that went out for people to come to Mississippi. And my parents heard that. And they went to Mississippi. 
I was just turning 12 years old when they met, went to Mississippi. That, I had no idea the danger that they were facing there. I was busy playing croquet at the Taylor's house where I was staying that summer when they went off. And when they came home, they told us stories about these young people who had stood up for democracy and for justice, and I was so amazed. They told us stories about the, the ladies and the, and the men that lived there who risked their lives, the African-American people who lived there who risked their lives to keep my parents in their home that year. This older lady who said, now tonight when you go to sleep, sleep in the back so when the shooting starts, you'll be okay back there. My parents said, what's the shooting? She said, that's okay, honey, I'm used to it. That was her life there, 1964. And so that night, my parents tried to sleep, and they couldn't sleep. And sure enough, in the middle of the night, they hear the shots ring out, and they rush up to the front. Here's the lady standing by the window, looking out in the dark night in Mississippi at the pickup truck. And the man who's driving, who's, who's shooting at her house, and has just shot and killed her dog. And my parents said, quick, quick, let's call the sheriff. Let's call the sheriff. What do you think she said? Can't do that? Why? She said, that is the sheriff. Honey, that is the sheriff. That's, how, that's, how, that's where we're coming from. And that's why we all want you to learn about the law and to learn about the Constitution and to learn about these things so that you can take it from here. And you can make this, this year your Freedom Summer. You can make your life your Freedom Summer. When my parents came home and told us these stories and, and, and what they had been through, I was so amazed at the courage of these people. And I was so happy that my parents had lived through this also. And that that lady lived through the night after the pickup truck drove away. And I started getting the idea that this is the way to live. Yes, it is risky, and yes, you do risk, but this is a way to live, to stand up for the things that you believe in, for our democracy. It's important enough, and it's also a good way of life. The next year, 1965, now we didn't see Birmingham so much on the TV, and, and there was still plenty going on with the Civil Rights Movement. We had Selma that year, and and so many things still going on. But now on TV, there was, there was news of the war in Vietnam. And when we turn on the TV after school, we would see the, the huts burning and smoking in this faraway place, Vietnam, and the children running out of them and running in terror, and the soldiers lying on the ground in their body bags. And every night, there was a, a newscaster on television named Walter Cronkite. And he would say, the body count today in Vietnam was eight. Eight soldiers were killed today in Vietnam. Next day, 10 soldiers were killed today in Vietnam. The body count is 10 for today. Every day, the body count of the war. We heard about over and over. And in church, what were we learning about? Peace, love, forgiveness. That Christmas time, we heard those messages of love and forgiveness. And on TV, what did we see? War, killing, bombing. And as kids have all through history, we saw through that. And we saw that's not right. That's not what we're learning. That's not the way that we're supposed to act. That's not our, our lessons. And so we decided to do something about it and take action, that next step that makes life so interesting. And so we decided to just wear simple black armbands to school. I didn't really want to at first because it was my older brother's idea and some of his friends. And they said, let's just wear black armbands and we'll, we'll support a truce that's being proposed by Senator Kennedy, Senator Robert Kennedy. And we'll also mourn for the dead. Because you know what happened in Birmingham after those kids did that? When the March of Was on, Ma on Washington happened, right, the famous March on Washington, that summer, after the kids did their action, the Birmingham Children's Crusade, there was the March on Washington in Washington. Martin Luther King made his famous speech. Everyone went home. And in Birmingham, the Ku Klux Klan bombed the church of the little girls, of the kids, I mean, that had their headquarters there. And four little girls were killed at that church as punishment for what they had been doing to stand up and speak up. And, and their charred bodies were found in the stairwell of the church. They were about the ages of my sisters and I. And so we had a mourning service we had had in 1963 for the kids. And some people there wore black armbands to the mourning service for the little girls who'd been killed in Birmingham. And so we knew about black armbands, and we knew that it was a symbol of mourning and sadness. And now we were sad again. Now we were sad about war. And so we decided, why don't we just wear those black armbands again? And we could show that we're sad about that. 
And so some kids decided to do it. And they asked me, come on, Beth, you can do it. I was scared. I was nervous. I didn't think I should do it because I was one of the youngest and I was shy. And they said, come on, come on, you can do it. And I thought, oh, I don't know. I don't want to get in trouble. But finally, I decided I would try to be strong like all those other kids had been. And, and so I put on my armband and I went off to school and I was really nervous. And, and I saw my friend Connie and she said, you better take that off. You're going to get in trouble. But I said, no, Connie, I want to speak up about this. And well, I knew I was probably going to be in trouble because a couple days earlier, the principals heard about our plan and they made a rule against armbands. And it came out in the newspaper that morning. So I had a feeling I was going to be in trouble. My dad didn't want us to wear the armbands because he said it's against the rules. But you see how kids are so persuasive. We said, Dad, look how you stand up for what you believe in. Yeah, see? So I was scared. I, got, I was nervous, and I had on my armband, and I, I walked in the school, and, and I saw my favorite teacher, Mr. Moberly, and he was standing by the door of math class with a pink slip in his hand. Oh, no, now I knew I was in trouble. I went up, and I picked up the pass from him, and I didn't say a word. I went straight down to the office very slowly. When I got there, Mrs. Tarm and the girls' advisor said, Mary Beth, you know, take that armband off. You're a good student, and you know that's against the rules. And so I looked around the office, and I looked at Mrs. Tarman. I had about that much courage, and it just ran out. And I said, OK, Mrs. Tarman, I took off that armband. I gave it to her, and I thought, oh, boy, that's over. As you can see, it wasn't over. I wouldn't be here today if Mrs. Tarman hadn't said, you know what, I'm going to suspend you for doing that because you broke the rules. You weren't supposed to wear that armband. I had, I had no idea that this small action was going to turn out to be a big thing. But I found out that's how history is made. It's by small actions a lot of times, by a lot of people who think they don't have the courage. And we, I went home, and my brother ended up getting suspended for an armband, and a boy named Chris Art, Eckhart, and about five other kids got suspended. People started getting really mad in town. And they said, you're so unpatriotic. And they called us communists, and they threw red paint at our house. And my mom would say, we're not communists, we're Methodists. Well, by then, we were actually Quakers also. We were involved with the Quakers, too. And someone called our house and, and asked for Mary Beth. And I said, yes, this is Mary Beth. And she said, I'm going to kill you. And I said, ah, these people, these crazy people, the haters. I couldn't believe it. All we were doing was speaking up for peace. And so we were. We were in trouble, and we didn't know what to do. And a group called the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, they came and asked if they could help. They've gone to the Supreme Court more than any group in the United States, as it turns out. And they've been around for 100 years. And they said, we believe kids have rights, too, and kids should have their First Amendment rights. And so they offered to help us. And a very wonderful lawyer came and helped us. And he was so kind, and his name was Dan Johnston. And he took this to court. And, and we lost at a court just like this at the district level. We lost because the, ar the lawyers argued back and forth. And our lawyers said, but the kids should have some rights. They weren't hurting anybody. And the lawyer for the school board said, yeah, but they broke the rule. That's all you need to know. Kids have to follow the rules. And so we lost. And it was appealed to the appeals court. And the same thing happened. And we lost again. And I thought, of course we're going to lose. You know, No big important judge is going to say that kids have rights. But now I, I see that that's not true. And it was appealed to the Supreme Court, which only takes about 70 cases a year, 70, 70, out of around 10,000 cases that want to be heard at the Supreme Court. They only have time to hear about 70. And so I was so happy when they took our case, but I still thought, of course, we're going to lose. So I was really happy in 1969 February 24th, the same day as Marbury versus Madison for all you lawyers and judges. Um, not the same year, though, but um, there was another very important case decided that day. February 24th, 1969, the Supreme Court ruled by 7 to 2 that neither students or teachers, all you teachers, where's our teachers? Come on, teachers, yeah. <laughs> neither students or teachers give up their rights when they enter the schoolhouse gate. And they said that schools should not be enclaves of totalitarianism. And my favorite thing, I think, from the ruling was that students are persons. Yeah, you like being persons, guys? Yeah, you're persons now. Students are persons. 
with the rights and responsibilities of persons under our Constitution. It was a wonderful ruling. I had no idea how important this ruling was going to be or that it was going to affect also my life. I grew up and I, I became a nurse and one day I was reading for my nursing exam and there in my nursing book was our case. I couldn't believe it. That's when I found out that nurses need to learn about this because it has to do with students' rights and children's rights and teenagers' rights. And I learned that lawyers learn about it and judges learn and teachers and superintendents and, and a lot of people learn about this case. There were several cases after ours that cut back on the rights of students also. But the basic idea that students have rights continues today. Now there are so many kids all over the country as I travel on my Tinker Tour. I meet so many kids who are speaking up about so many different things, um, whether it's Black Lives Matter, kids who are doing actions right here in Buffalo, uh, whether it's kids who are speaking up for the environment, kids who are speaking up for their dress code policies, they want to wear certain things, um, kids who are standing up for all kinds of things. Some kids I just heard about recently had a, a protest at their school because someone had made a, um, a negative comment about Muslims. One of the school board members had made a negative comment saying that Muslims aren't clean or something like that. And these kids are standing up for that and they're speaking up. And I really admired that they did that. <coughs> so thank you all for having me here today. I'm so glad to be here for your celebration of the Constitution and to say that kids also have rights and kids are also in the Constitution too. Thanks again.